All right, so we're back. This is lecture four of CS164. So today we dive into the part of the course for which you probably have all been here, which is namely the iOS aspect.、Um, along the way,、um, your mind will probably get a little bit bent by the syntax that we're about to see in a language called Objective C, but you'll see that a lot of the issues that we've been talking about over the past several weeks of the semester will recur. So even if some of the syntax and some of the jargon actually seemed new, realize that almost all of these ideas have we seen before. So, Books.、Um, there is a non trivially sized list of books in the course's syllabus. Most of them you don't really need, frankly, for the course, and they're all only recommended, not actually required. But for this part of the course, for what it's worth,、um, these two books are actually quite useful. So, this is a book akin to what we used in CS50 for C. This is the Objective C counterpart. It's a little dense and it's a lot of pages, so it's not the sort of thing that you use so much as a reference. But if you really want to learn the underpinnings of the language and really exit the course knowing Objective C in an Out. This is a particularly good reference.、Um, if you're more interested in the iOS aspect of the course, which uses Objective C, but Objective C can be used outside of the context of iOS, this is actually a really good book.、Um, as I mentioned in the first lecture, it's pretty, it's colorful, and whatnot, has nice of code examples. It's also been updated for iOS 5, which is the version of the software development kit that we'll be using for the course. And I mentioned this book. More than I would typically mention books in a course, because there's a lot of crappy documentation out there, or lots of crappy tutorials on the internet.、Um, as iOS has gotten popularized, and same for Android, everyone and anyone has a blog about how to write iOS software, but it's not necessarily correct half of the time.、Um, and even Apple's documentation, while very rich, is horribly organized. And so it's really hard to go through it from start to finish. It's much more of a sort of you Google your way into the innards of Apple's documentation. So this is actually quite a Helpful reference. So, if you're on the fence about getting any books, this is probably the one to choose if you would find that helpful. So, this is the kind of stuff we're going to start seeing today. Hopefully, it should bring back fond memories of C, albeit with some new syntax. But before we dive in, let's try to explore some of the topics that we will have to start taking for granted in this new world of iOS. So, iOS is very much object oriented.、Uh, Objective C itself is a proper subset of C, which means it supports all of C plus some more stuff. For those familiar, It adds essentially object oriented features to C, hence the objective in Objective C. So, what did we mean over the past few weeks, or from CS51, if you've taken it in years past, by object oriented programming? What is OOP all about? What do you got? Okay. Okay, so in object oriented、uh, programming, you have classes, and classes have methods, which are functions that are sort of built into these classes. And classes also have one other defining characteristic. Besides methods, they also have. Values, properties, data, some kind of data members inside of them. And this is consistent with this buzzword known as encapsulation or data hiding, where inside of this object you can put all sorts of pieces of data, just like you do in C with what, piece of,、uh, what construct in C supports the same notion of encapsulation. Yeah, so structs in C. But structs in C are relatively primitive and they can't really support methods. They kind of can. If you're familiar with something called function pointers, perhaps from CS61, you can actually associate with a struct an actual function, but the language just wasn't really designed with this in mind. So Objective C, PHP, C, Sharp, other languages support actual objects which have methods and data associated with them. Now, when we talked about PHP a couple weeks back, we did use this phrase data hiding. What, what do we mean by hiding data inside of a class? Who cares? What's the motivation there? Yeah? You can essentially prevent、like、a client side user from manipulating the data in the way you don't want them to. Perfect. Sort of change implementations without have them having to worry about, you know, worrying about specific stuff. Is it an int? Is it a flow? Yeah, exactly. You can hide some piece of data, like, say, a student's name, and you can store it however you want as one big string, as two strings, first name and last name, as three strings, first, middle, last name, as four strings if you have a title or a suffix to the name. But you can still expose that data to the user, but in an immutable way by providing them with some convenience method, like a, an accessor method or a getter method, whose sole purpose in life is to return that data or some formatting thereof.
of. So this is generally a good thing, especially when you start working with a partner, because now you and your partner, as you've perhaps experienced for Project Zero, can decide on what functionality each of you is going to provide to the other. But he or she doesn't have to worry about the underlying implementation. And similarly, if six months hence on that same project or some real world job, you decide that, wow, an n squared algorithm was the wrong way to implement this particular method, it doesn't matter to your partner because you can go back in, retool it, and so long as you maintain the same API, the outward facing code, then it's no problem for your friend or partner. So in PHP, let me go ahead and open up a terminal window. We have this ability to define a class. So let's say this is a student.php. And I'm going to go ahead and do class uh, student. And then we'll get started here. And just a couple data members. What do we typically associate with a student? Uh, sorry? So a name. OK, so we have a name. So we might say something like uh, we could say uh, public name, and that's going to be a string. What else might we have? Public year. So we might have year. That might be an int. And let's, let's leave it at that for now, because we don't really need more to discuss this. So public is sort of the cheat here. right? If I'm specifying public, that means that a user can access members of this class using fairly familiar syntax. So now if we go rather, if we go down here, I can do something like s gets new student. And that's going to create in memory a student object. And if I want to assign this student a name, I can simply say David. And if I want to assign David a year, I can do something like this. But I have to decide here, is it going to be quote unquote? Is it going to be an int? And so these are among the sort of design decisions that you've perhaps had to consider for project zero. Um, but this is not the best design. Why? Let's be extra clear here. We're encapsulating the data, but we're not really doing anything more than a C struct. Why? What's bad about this design? Yeah, Zach. I want to change my name. Yeah. So now I have this ability, which might not be what I intend to actually change the name to be something completely different at some point in my code. And maybe this is a complete accident, right? Maybe there's just a bug, but the fact that I'm exposing myself to this risk is generally not a good thing. Plus, for all the reasons we discussed a second ago, if I want to hide the underlying implementation of the name, I might not want to expose Tommy or David as the name, but rather those might be one of several fields that are hidden inside of this object. So in version of two of this, when we've tinkered in the past, we instead did something like private, and now we have a private name, now we have a private year. So now this syntax is no longer valid. You will actually get a compiler error because the compiler or the interpreter will realize that mm -mm, that's a private data member. You're trying to access a private field, and so no, you may not do this. So the code won't, in fact, run properly. So how do we fix this in PHP? Yeah, yeah. so we need some kind of. Um, function or method inside. So uh, typically, we would do something like public function, and let's call it get name, that we could call it really anything we want. And it's kind of a stupid method, but we can just say this name. And then similarly, can we have public function get year? And then we could say return this year. And just as an aside, can you make methods private? Yeah. OK, so you can, but why would you? Because clearly now, if that's private, similarly, can I not access it lower in my file? So you can use the public methods to encapsulate functionality. Okay, so you can use public methods to encapsulate functionality, but when might you want a private method? So to encapsulate the internal. Okay. Sorry, because it's used in a public method. Ah, good. Good. So especially in Project Zero or now Project One, if you find yourself copying, pasting code, especially in a project like Project Zero, where you have a lot of entities like a course or a faculty member or a student or whatever, however you've modeled your world, there might, there might very well be chunks of code that you're kind of using all over the place to format names of a course versus names of a professor or the like. And so those kinds of things, in theory, can be factored out into private methods, into some other class altogether. So you certainly can have private methods if your own public methods, therefore, call those. And that's not something that your partner would even have to know or care about. So for now, we've got this. Unfortunately, we still don't have one capability. This syntax still doesn't work, because I'm trying to set name and year. So what else do I need to add to the mix here? You know, so setters, right, or mutator methods, as they're sometimes called. So the convention typically there is to call it something like public function set name, and then I've got to take an uh, argument in this case, and then I might do something like this name gets name. However, I could do some validation, right? I could say if Sterling equals equals zero, uh, change the name to something default, like unnamed student, or something like that. So with setters, you have this ability to exercise some data control, whereas you don't have 
have that for something like this uh, naive approach down here. And let's do the similarly public function set year, year. And this is a much better candidate for some validation, because at the moment, I could pass in really anything. But what might I also want to do in this case when setting a year? This is a prime candidate for some kind of data validation, right? So before I actually set the year, I could do something like if it's not the case that year matches a regular expression like this. So if unfamiliar, this is just a regular expression, rather, let's say the positive. If the year argument that I've been passed in matches four decimal digits from the start of the string to the end of the string, then go ahead and set it. Otherwise, do not. Unfortunately, and not to digress here, but if there's in fact an error in this scenario, how do I signal the error to the user with this setter method? What's that? Nothing at all. A nothing at all? So not, right at the moment, I do nothing. Right? This apparently is some kind of void method who does something but doesn't necessarily return a value. But this is kind of an error if the user types in foo instead of a number, 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 number. So how, what are my available techniques for signaling an error? Yeah, Carl. Try exceptions. OK. OK, that you could cache inside of the function. That, what do you mean by that latter phrase? Oh, uh, so you could return a nonsense value back. Okay. Yes, OK. So you could return some sentinel value. And very common in PHP, as you might have seen in the documentation, is to return false quite a bit. Sometimes null, but generally false signifies errors. Or you can throw exceptions. And exceptions, even though we haven't talked about them much in this class, we'll see them a little bit in Objective-C. But you could do something like else, throw, new. And this is the simplest of exceptions to throw. This is not all that useful, because it doesn't actually have an error message associated with it. But know that you can create an exception object in PHP and actually throw some kind of special exception object inside of which will include, somewhat automatically for you, the line number where the exception was thrown, the file where the exception was thrown, plus a custom error message and or code that you might want to provide. So this is one approach as well. And so which one's right? To be honest, exception throwing is not all that common in PHP, though it does depend sometimes on the library you're using. So returning something like false is pretty reasonable. In this case, we could return true, although it might be useful to instead actually return the year itself, just because and there's this notion of chaining where you might want to get back this very value that you passed in. So we have a few options here. But the short of it is that now that we have setters, we have the ability to maintain data integrity. Right? We can ensure that we're only setting it to some legitimate value. But this is kind of a mess. right? I cut us short a moment ago and said, fine, just name and year. But imagine if we had let that conversation, the uh, volunteering of ideas continue, and we had not just name and year, but dorm and phone number and email address. Right, this very quickly starts to devolve into what kind of experience? There's a whole lot of copy paste, right? essentially. Or it's a whole lot of tedium where you're writing the same kind of boilerplate code again and again and again. So how do you avoid this? Well, in short, you might not necessarily. If you do have custom validation that you want to impose on different fields, you maybe can't avoid all of this. If you're actually using a library or something called an ORM, and to some extent something like CodeIgniter or some of the frameworks you might have vetted for Project 1, you can tell the libraries to do this for you, whereby you say, this is an email a, a formatted field. This is a numerically formatted field. But the only takeaway there is that someone else has gone through all the trouble of writing those kinds of validation methods. But if you're not familiar, know that PHP does provide some fundamentally different ways of implementing these same ideas, which might be good, might be bad, depending on the context. But PHP provides some things called magic methods. And you can actually implement a method inside of a PHP class called underscore underscore get. A very common convention in PHP in most languages is that the compiler or interpreter reserves for itself anything named with underscore underscore. The idea being you should never do that. Using a single underscore is fine. Double is generally bad. So in this case, this is actually a really useful thing because I could do something like this. Uh, switch on name. And I could have a case like case uh, name. And then I'm going to do something, break. And then I'm going to have a case year. And then I'm going to do something, and then break. And then that's it. So underscore underscore get, as you might be inferring, is a magical method, that's literally what PHP calls it, that is invoked any time you try to access a data field. And let me go ahead and now 
I'll save this file so that we, I can post it later. I'm going to go ahead and delete all of these getters and setters that we defined a moment ago. And what you can now do is something like this some stuff. And now I can do echo s name. So the mere fact that I'm echoing or trying to get the value of s arrow name is going to try to access a field that apparently, according to my definition up here, and actually let me do this a little further. Let me delete these for the moment. It doesn't exist, right? This class has been so whittled down that there's no mention of name publicly or privately. There's definitely no method called name. All there is is this magical method. So, what PHP will do is that when you do access a field like s arrow name, if it doesn't exist, it will call for you this magical method, which if you have implemented, you can then exercise control over exactly what's returned. So, in this case here, I could do something like, well, Ideally, I just want to return something like、uh, this name. But the,、uh, what I can actually do in something like this is I can say private properties, and I can declare this as, for instance, an array. And then what I can do is this properties, quote unquote, name. I can essentially have a secret storage container that stores all of these fields. If only to eliminate a lot of the boilerplate code that I would have had to write again and again and again and again for all of these getters, which are almost all identical if all they do is return this arrow something. So, this is perhaps an elegant solution to that problem of code duplication, but the setters can be implemented similarly. And if you do implement them in this way, you would do public function underscore underscore set name and a value. And I know that it takes those two arguments just, by, just from the documentation. And in here, I would ha then have to decide based on the name how and where to set that field. And so realize this is one approach that's available to you. So, frankly, this is one of the sexier features of PHP that allows you to lessen the amount of code that you have to write while still providing some fairly basic functionality. And there's a bunch of others in addition to those. Yeah, Carl. Instead of that, you just、um, have、uh, $s、uh, arrow name equals. Exactly. So, what's nice about PHP is that if it realizes that you are do writing code like this, s arrow name gets something, the mere fact that you have the arrow on the left and the assignment operator on the right, it's going to invoke for you underscore underscore set magically, as they say. So, there's one thing worth noting here is that we're using this setter, and yet I have an opportunity right from the start to initialize this student object. In fact, that might be much more appropriate if you never really want empty,、uh, data less student objects to exist in memory. You don't want to use setters per se. How else can you pass in values or default values to objects? Yeah, like so. Yeah, so you have constructors, right? And so in PHP, unfortunately, you can only explicitly define one constructor function,、uh, one constructor method,、um, because in PHP, you can't override methods' names by having a foo method that takes one argument and then a a another foo method that takes two arguments, which you can do in other languages like Java.、Um, And the like,、um, you can achieve that same functionality, but not as cleanly. So for now, let's just assume that I'm going to implement public function underscore underscore construct. And I can specify values to take. I can do something like name and I can take year. And then here, let's skip data validation for the moment. Let's just do this name gets name and this year gets year. And let's roll back to the original version whereby, you know what, I'm just going to explicitly say we have a private name and a private year. So here's my construct. And what's good about this model now? Whereby I can call the constructor as follows. Instead of new student, I can instead say David, comma, 1999, close, paren, or something like that. What's advantageous now about introducing this third magical method? Magical only in as much as it starts with underscore, underscore. Here. Yeah. Perfect. So, in this way, it's a little more efficient in that you don't have to, one, instantiate the object, two, go ahead and set the actual properties. And also, as I suggested earlier, it also, if we now eliminate the setter method, which we've already, if we eliminate the setter method, 
here, now there's no way for a dataless student object to exist because when you instantiate this student object now, you have to provide those values. And in fact, the interpreter will yell at you if you try to just instantiate a student object without passing in any arguments or the wrong number of arguments. So that's a plus.、Um, what else does this allow us to do? Well, similarly, could you put some kind of data validation here? Although the downside here is that it's typically not good practice for constructors to throw exceptions or the like. Um, and so there's some less obvious ways of handling errors potentially.、Um, but also, how does this approach to constructors maybe not scale?、Right? We're also kind of we're skimping on what a student is for the sake of discussion. But what's the logical extension of this approach? Yeah. Right, it's going to get a little atrocious once we give students、uh, like、email addresses and phone numbers and dorms and home addresses and all of this. And my God, then you have to be mindful of the order. And so, in terms of backwards compatibility and agreeing with your partner or some company as to what your API is, you can't tomorrow change the order of name and year just because you decide a little anally that you prefer it the other way. Because their code, of course, is now going to break. Any method call that said foo comma bar, they're going to have to change to bar comma foo. And similarly, if you keep adding It、and adding and adding to this comma-separated list, you can at least be backwards compatible like this. You can say, you know what, we're going to support an email address, but just in case you're using the old version of the API, we're going to give it a default value of false. So PHP does have this ability to assign default values, so that you can still call this constructor with two arguments, or if you want three. So that helps mitigate backwards compatibility. But again, if we get up to 20、uh, properties, this is just going to be a pain. So what's a solution to that problem, perhaps? Where you want to pass in a large or arbitrary number of arguments, but you don't want to hard code it in advance. Yeah. So a very common paradigm in Perl and in PHP and in JavaScript, especially, is you know what? Let's not even commit to some order because I'm never going to be happy with the right order, and then we're going to run into issues with which should be,、uh, uh, which are required, which are optional fields, what should the order be. So you know what? I could actually say something like this: properties gets array, so that by default, this. Argument is just an empty array, and that's fine if we do want to allow dataless student objects to exist. And actually, if we don't want that, we can instead say, you know what, this has to be an array, but it's not going to have a default value. You've got to pass me in something. And for those unfamiliar, PHP 5.3. Um, which has started to come into vogue, actually does provide a bit of data type hinting. So PHP is still loosely typed, whereby you don't have to specify int and char and float and the like. But they're starting to provide us with features like this, where you can tell the interpreter, "This is I don't know what it's an array of, but it is an array." And by telling the interpreter array space and then variable name, it will ensure that only an array is passed in. And you can do this with objects as well, but not primitives, not int, char, float, and the like. All right. So, how do you then access these fields? Well, then you would simply do something like, well, properties, quote unquote, and then properties, quote unquote, year. Voila. So, in short, a whole number of directions you can go. And, and frankly, the very first approach of just having public data fields not horrible if you just need it for a simple container. But as soon as your code gets more sophisticated, as soon as you have to start making an API commitment to someone else, you better start thinking about these kinds of design decisions so you don't regret them later. So, any questions on OOP constructors, setters, getters? Because the syntax is about to change. <laughs> Anything at all? Everyone knows what OOP is now. Okay, no Objective C for you. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? All right, so let's let's dive in. So this is Objective C, and what looks familiar, right? Especially for those of you who haven't seen C for two or three years, what's what's familiar? What are you going to cling to now? What's argv? Yes, we've seen argv and argc. Those are back. What else? Yeah. Yeah, so something that looks like a header file. We have a slash, which we typically didn't see in something like CS50, but it does in fact exist all throughout the Linux source code and、uh, large-scale C programs.、Um, it's not include though; it's import, 
which actually has different meaning,、um, but we'll get to that. It's actually just a better version of include.、Um, seems like we have pointers, yay.、Um, seems like we have arrays, as in, suggested by the square brackets there. There's this funky notation of the at sign in something called an auto release pool. This was actually something that was only introduced into Objective C by Apple、uh, this past summer.、Uh, for the course, we will be using not only iOS 5, which is the latest version of the、uh, software that you might have on your own personal iOS device. But version 4.2 or, or rather 4.3 of the SDK, ideally on Lion, but if you still have Snow Leopard on your own computer, it's doable.、Um, just read the FAQs on the course's website as to what your options are. And if you have a PC, know that we've made available a dedicated computer lab in the Science Center that's usually used by the sciences, but we can use it anytime they're not holding classes or like there. Details on that are also in the FAQs.、Um, so just refer to that if need be.、Um, All right, and return zero. That looks pretty familiar. So it turns out that even though we're going to be using Xcode, which is Apple's own IDE, integrated development environment, sort of Apple's version of Eclipse or NetBeans or the like,、um, you can write Objective C. Um, certainly, at a command line using Notepad or Vim or Emacs or the like, it's really a language not all that dissimilar from C. But as soon as you want to start doing iPhone or iPad programming, well, then there's just so much in the way of libraries that Apple provides that it's just a pain to configure it all yourself at the command line or to configure a make file、uh, for yourself. And so, this is why, certainly in this world, people tend to use the IDE. But for the simple case of discussion, We can actually use it at the command line. And the compiler that Xcode now uses is something called Clang.、Um, this is, in many ways, a better version of GCC. It actually supports many of the same command line switches that you might have used in 50 or 61.、Um, but its error messages, among other things, are typically a little more clear.、Uh, you might think, recall fondly GCC's fairly arcane error messages. Clangs are still somewhat arcane, but there's at least more detail. And so, one of the nice features about Xcode is that it leverages this Clang compiler to provide you with pretty good suggestions and yellow triangles and red Xs when something's Wrong with your code by pre processing it and figuring out where you might have erred. So you'll actually find, I hope, that Xcode's actually a pretty good development environment.、Um, and in fact, it uses,、um, for those who haven't taken something like CS 153 compilers at the college,、um, this is、uh, Clang's what's generally known as a front end to a compiler. LLVM is the back end that Apple uses. And essentially, this means that Clang compiles your code, your Objective C, into some in intermediate representation. And then the back end compiler takes over from there and takes It down to zeros and ones.、Um, so realize that Clang and LLVM are the ones that you'll use by default, but GCC was used for many years by Apple and the like for Xcode. So you may see mentions of that on the internet. All right, so let's go ahead and write a very simple、uh, Objective C program like this one here. So let me go ahead and open up not in the appliance. Let's turn this off now and largely for the rest of the term after Project One. And let's go into a terminal window on my own Mac. And notice that I do have Clang installed because I installed Xcode on my computer. I also have GCC, which comes with Xcode as well.、Um, but for now, we'll just use Clang. And let me go ahead and create something like hello.m.、Um, typically, in the world of Objective C, instead of having .h and .c files, you have .h and .m. Files, .m generally denoting methods. Your methods go in there and your header declarations go somewhere else.、Uh, let me go ahead and、uh, go ahead do whoops, import foundation slash foundation.h. Let me go ahead and do int main int argc const char star argv.、Um, you'll see. And this is one disclaimer about Xcode. Many different people seem to contribute code to the Xcode IDE. So you will see stylistic differences throughout their various templates, which I find personally annoying.、Um, you'll see a space here sometimes. You won't see a space here sometimes, as in the first part of the semester. Doesn't matter what you do, so long as you are self consistent and doing something reasonable. And so long as you don't do something like this, which some people sometimes do for God knows what reason. All right. <laughs> There is one wrong way to indent your curly braces.、Um, so now let's go ahead and do at auto release pool. And let's go ahead here. Whoops. And ns log. And then we'll tease apart what these things are. And then we'll actually fire up Xcode to see things more in situ. All right. 
So that is exactly what we typed earlier, uh, or what we had in the slide earlier. So let's tease apart these few parts. So at the very top, we do have something that's quite reminiscent of C. It's import, though, instead of include. And does anyone know or want to conjecture what the difference is between import and include? Uh, maybe it only takes the specific things that you call in your program. Not quite. It does actually take them all. But a good analogy here is PHP's require once function, which means that you can import the same file again and again and again in all of your various files. And you don't have to worry about doing it more than once. They're not, you're not going to get an error message from the compiler saying you already defined foo in two uh, twice just because the same file is read. Because recall from CS50, what the preprocessor in the compiler does is it will open up the file called foundation.h, copy its contents, and effectively paste them into the top of your file as though you yourself pasted them there. Um, for those more familiar with low-level C code or something like CS61, it, it, this uh, include statement from years past will, it could be used to implement this same functionality, but you would have to do something like this, like define foundation, and then you would say if n def if not defined underscore foundation. So in short, there was this very hackish way with what are called macros or preprocessor directives in GCC and other compilers where you could teach the compiler that this file's been loaded before, and you teach the compiler such by defining what's effectively a global preprocessor variable, and then subsequently always checking for it before you proceed to read the rest of the file. So this is just a long way of saying that Objective-C has made this better. So foundation slash, um, what's meant by the preceding word foundation slash? It's actually as simple as it looks. It's just a subdirectory, right? So somewhere on the system, there is a foundation directory inside of which is a file called foundation.h. If you have a Mac or you're using the lab Macs, most of these things tend to live in slash system, slash libraries, slash frameworks. So you can actually poke around and see these files on your own or someone else's Mac. All right, so this, let's assume, is all the same as always, where you can take in command line arguments. Auto release pool we'll come back to later today and next week. Um, this has to do with memory management. So if you never really liked malloc, um, you don't have to worry about malloc anymore because it's gone, mostly. Um, but although you will see that there's actually a lot of C code throughout the iOS SDK, especially for the lowest level, highest performing things like graphics, which still do make use of C. Uh, but for the most part, every, uh, most things are in Objective-C. So we'll come back to what an auto-release pool is in NSLog. You want to hazard a guess as to what this is used for? Printing, right? So this is uh, similar in spirit to printf, but it's a little more versatile in that it's specifically meant to be used for logging purposes. NS stands for next step. So if you've read about Steve Jobs and his history with next step and the operating system that uh, Apple acquired many years ago, um, they've maintained Apple internally this next step prefix, NS, in front of many, many of their constants and their class names because of the history of the language and the software development kit. So for now, NS log you can think of as printf. Um, the at sign, what's this here? This is new. Yeah. Exactly. Interpret this as a string. So in the world of iOS, there's actually two types of strings. There are the char stars from yesteryear that we've used in CS50 and 61 and the like. But there's also at, quote unquote, which are called NS strings. So capital N, capital S, capital S string. This is a proper object. So if you're familiar with Java from high school or the like, and you might recall that strings, whenever you double quote something, are automatically string objects. Same idea here, but so as to distinguish between char stars and string objects objects or n string objects, you have to prefix uh, quote unquote with the at sign in Objective C to say this is actually an object. And the upside of this is that even though it still looks like a string, we can in theory perform operations on it, methods on it, like getting its length or uh, changing it to uppercase, changing it to lowercase on the object itself without having to pass it around all over the place like we might actually do in C. And then return zero just means good. Uh, nothing went wrong, but you can return almost an infinite number of other integers to signify some kind of error. So let's actually then do this in the context of Xcode rather than Vim. So I'm going to go ahead and fire up Xcode. And what you'll see from the get-go is that uh, you'll typically get this screen at the start. 
And just to give you a quick tour through this so that you don't get lost when playing along at home,、um, typically you're almost always going to click the Create New Xcode Project. However, if you do、um, enable Git integration, which Xcode has, which can be useful, you can actually connect directly to a repository to grab your code, which can be useful for working with a buddy. And now let's click Create New Xcode Project. And here's where the fun begins, but also sometimes the potential confusion. Because we're using an IDE and because we're using these templates that Apple provides, realize that on occasion there's going to be a lot of magic happening because whoever made the template、uh, wrote a little bit of code or tinkered around with the GUI and then saved the state of the GUI in such a way that you then don't have to figure out all of the various options to configure just to use that particular template. What do I mean by a template? Well, you might be familiar with this. A utility Application in iOS or in Android. Let me go ahead and just call this demo.、Um, and、I'll, we'll come back to the screen here in a moment. Let me just go ahead and quickly create a project to show you what I mean by a template. So when you say, give me a template, you then are opened up into the IDE, which at first glance is quite overwhelming. So let's ignore almost everything. In fact, let me turn off the right hand side thing. Let me zoom in on the left hand side. This is what we mean by a template. Xcode automatically gives you a whole bunch of files there on the top left. And we'll tease apart today and next week all of the various names and semantics of these files. But notice you're given a whole bunch of .h files and a whole bunch of .m files. This is useful because it's just incredibly tedious if you had to manually create all of these damn files just to create the simplest of Hello World applications.、Um, if you're familiar with the iPad, a very common paradigm in the iPad is the, what's called a split view controller, whereby if you Uh, the mail application. If you have an iPad, it has your inbox on the left hand side if you're holding the thing in landscape mode, and your email is on the right hand side. And if you turn it, it automatically readjusts itself to the screen. These, this is the kind of built in functionality you get for free because someone else wrote it、uh, in the form of these templates. So just realize that the templates tend to hide some magic. And even I, last night, when I was trying to write a simple application from scratch, it was a pain in the neck using the latest version of the SDK because what I had taken for granted in the old version, I had to figure Out what options someone else had clicked. So just don't get frustrated by these stupid things like I did last night.、Um, just realize it's not really intellectually interesting, it's just a mechanical kind of thing. And Google is your friend. Stack Overflow, in particular, is quite a good reference for this sort of stuff. So let's start with a simpler one. Before we dive into an iOS application, let me go ahead and open up、uh, one of the prefabbed examples from today, which is just. Hello, Objective C. Actually, let me not do that. Let me pretend to do it from scratch. So, let me go back to the template window. And I'm going to choose instead of any of the things under iOS for now, I'm going to choose something under Mac OS only because I just want to do something at the command line with Objective C. And I don't want all of the cruft that they would otherwise give me for an iPhone or iPad app. So, I'm going to choose Command Line Tool. I'm going to click Next. I'm going to go ahead and call this Hello, Objective C. Um, notice these things here, company identifier.、Um, often, this is just a domain name in reverse order. It can really be anything you want. But the idea here is that if you ship this code to actual devices or make it available through the App Store, you need some unique identifier. So, a very common paradigm in the Java world, too, is what do you have that's unique? Well, probably your email address or at least your domain name that you own or your company owns. So, this is just a convention in the world reversing domain names so that with low probability, will some random person on the internet choose? That same unique identifier for their app. So, my bundle identifier is going to be edu.harvard.helloobjectivec. What language do I want to use? Well, unfortunately, Objective C is not in the menu, but it is in fact there. So, we obviously don't want C, we don't want C, core data, we'll talk about later in the semester, and core and core foundation. So, we saw this word before. The foundation classes are simply a whole bunch of things that you get with Objective C、um, through this SDK, things like NS string and a lot of the basics we're going to start taking for granted. It's sort of like the standard library of C, if you recall, standard IO and standard lib.、Um, use automatic reference counting. So, this is the latest and greatest of features in Objective C. And the class, frankly, is going to be a little easier now than it would have been had this course been offered last year. Because last year, up until summer at WWDC, there was no such thing as ARC, automatic reference counting.、Uh, this is a good thing. So, essentially, a year ago, you would have to do not only all of the mallocs for your code and all of the freeze for your code, but also something called reference counting, where anytime You have a pointer in memory to some object. For each additional pointer that you want to have around, you would typically 
plus one that object's reference count.、Um, languages like Scheme or Lisp actually do something similar for memory management, and we'll tease this apart. But for now, know that memory management in iOS has gotten a lot simpler, which is a good thing because it means you're less prone to errors.、Um, the downside, though, is that there's going to be a huge amount of material on the web,、um, a huge number of books on shelves that still use the old version. So keywords that are now deprecated are keywords like retain and release and auto release. So I mention this now again because the new books. Know about this change, but if you're just googling around trying to teach yourself, realize you might run into old language versions that might otherwise confuse. So here we go. Hello, Objective C, Edu.Harvard Foundation. We'll use Arc. <coughs> Next, it's just asking me where I'd like to save the files.、Um, if I were actually working with someone else, or if this was going to be more than Hello World, I would turn on a Git repository like that. So let me go ahead and create. And here's what I get in the way of a template for. A, uh, the simplest of command line apps. So let's do a quick tour of the user interface here, without getting too stuck up on、um, implementation details like this. So Xcode, Xcode again is what we're seeing and playing with in just a moment. You get this from the Mac App Store these days, which comes with Lion and it's free if you have Lion. It's ninety-nine dollars if you don't, or if you have creative other ways per the FAQs on the course's website. But here's a. A general tour of the、um, interface for Xcode. Essentially, on the left-hand side, we're always going to see our files, and this is quite like Eclipse and NetBeans and Visual Studio and the like. In the middle, you're going to usually see your source code. A somewhat useful feature in Xcode, though, is you can see two panels of your so source code for multiple reasons. Either one to do diffs, so you can use version control built into the IDE and see what was it looked like yesterday, what it looks like today. It can also be used for dragging and dropping things from one file to another, as we'll see, especially for user interface design. At the bottom of the screen here in green is the debug window. So rather than open a terminal, you actually have something like a terminal built in, and that's where you'll see your NS log messages. That's where you can use GDB or its newest counterpart at the command line there. And at the right-hand side is every is where Apple put everything. That used to be in different places in the IDE, but they wanted to make it look simpler, so they put hundreds of feature into the right-hand side, which you can simply close by default. So I do kind of mean this, right? They made Xcode look like this, which couldn't possibly look more friendly or more like iTunes. To run and compile your code, you click the play button. <laughs> Because they moved all of the complexity to the right-hand side. So honestly, as you acclimate to this environment, just like NetBeans or Eclipse, if you had a had a learning curve with those, you know, when in doubt, hide things so it looks a little less scary, and then gradually unearth what you actually care about. So almost always, these little icons in the top right can help you navigate. Almost always, initially at least, just leave a couple of them selected: the default one on the left,、um, and then the default one on the left here as well, and that will keep the screen fairly. Clear. So here,、um, notice that my project, which I just started, haven't written any code yet, is selected by default, and I see all of this crazy stuff in the middle of the screen. So if you think back now to CS50 and 61, where you had make files, or you had environment variables, or you had a, a configure file, in C there's many ways in which you can configure the compilation of a program. What Apple has done is essentially made almost all of those kinds of settings accessible within a GUI. So realize that all of the various drop-down menus and such you see here are fairly low-level details, like what compiler to use, what language to use,、uh, what version of iOS to support, and so forth. Those Low-level details, and elsewhere we'll see other low-level details like: Do you want the application to still show the clock and the battery status, or do you want to hide that?、Uh, you might otherwise do those in、um, in code, but you can also do them with this GUI environment. So, in short, there's a whole lot of options, many of which, most of which, probably you won't ever have to care about. But just do beware tinkering with those things, because I dare say, if you try changing this knob and turning this thing and then forget what you did, it's very easy to break a project because there's so much going on behind the scenes. So, look、um, and save, but don't necessarily tinker unless you know what you're trying to do. So let's take a quick tour now of the files that await here. So underneath my project, there's a folder. There's this folder. There's this folder. There's this folder. Turns out these are not really folders. So these are groups. So there's an abstraction layer here, whereby all of these things might very well be in the same folder on your file system, somewhere on your hard drive. But just for the sake of mental organization, you can create what look like folders, but are technically groups that allow you to just hierarchically organize things. And what you'll find in different books and different versions of Xcode, Apple's own Layout of code has changed a lot over time. In the past two years alone,、um, this stuff keeps changing. So here too, if you're looking up other resources and you don't see a foo folder, just realize it might be because Apple changed their mind and kind of rejiggered things over recent years to just lay things out differently.、Um, so what's actually in here? So one. 
Here is my main.m file. And that's where the only code of interest actually is. It starts with some、uh, boilerplate comments. It plugged in my name because it knows this is my computer. I could define a company name if I want or put anything else up there. I've got the import statements. I've got the function declaration, ns auto release pool, and that's it. Inside of there is nslog, quote unquote, hello world. So before we tease apart what else is in this file, let's go ahead and just run it, iTunes style, up here. Run. Notice that it builds succeeded, and voila, at the very bottom right, you have some very esoteric output, but among which is quote unquote hello world. And there's also stuff there. There's obviously the date and the time, and、uh, I forget what some of that is, the process ID perhaps, or something along those lines.、It、tells you how long it took. So this is the output of this program. Of course, for actual iOS and iPhone apps, we're going to have them popping up in a device or a simulator, but that's all it took to actually write this program. And in fact, let me go back to my mention of Clang. Let me just copy and paste this string. Let me now go into my desktop, into hello Objective C, hello Objective C, and here are three files main.m, hello, hello Objective C.1, and then this PCH file. Here's main.m, the same file Apple gave me for free. Let me go ahead and run clang、uh, with the flag of Objective C with Arc enabled on a file called main.m using a dash framework of foundation so that I can use the ns methods and the like. It went ahead and compiled. If I do ls again, notice I now have a.out, a.out, voila. So realize there's no magic with the IDE, it's just hiding some of the details with which you're probably familiar from this past fall or a couple of years back. All right, so let's just tease apart a couple of these files so that we can then move on to more interesting designs than Hello World.、Um, this dot one file you can generally delete, at least for the things we're doing, because it's meant for a man page. If you recall typing man GCC or pulling up the man pages in a Linux environment, same idea.、Um, and because we said give me a command line application, I got some of this boilerplate, but I can go ahead and delete. Just beware when you delete, you'll be prompted with things like this. Do you want to remove the reference? Which means keep the file, just get it out of this project, or actually delete the file. In this case, I don't really care, so I'll ditch it altogether. Now, over here,、uh, a PCH file. So, the comment atop this kind of explains what it is. A PCH file is a pre compiled header. You will rarely, if ever, need to touch these. Think of this as a file that's automatically prepended to all of your files. And in this case, you're sort of automatically getting access to the foundation class, even if you don't explicitly specify it, but you can put more stuff there. So, this is one of those files that it exists. You don't really need to worry about it, but don't delete it because the compiler will then choke because it expects that it exists. Foundation framework. So, these are just all of the header files. In the foundation、uh, framework, so to speak. All of these you get access to by way of the import statement that we saw before.、Um, these are not actually all copied into your program per se. It's simply here so that you can browse them if you want, but frankly, it's typically easier to look at the documentation online. But if we do scroll down here, we should see some things that are familiar, like ns string, and indeed, there is someone's. Declaration of everything related to this thing we called an NS string. And if this looks overwhelming, don't worry. C looks exactly like this underneath the hood.、Um, it's there if you need it, but the documentation on the web is much more user friendly. And lastly, there's this. And what is this? It's the binary. It's a dot out, but with a sexier name. And so if we go ahead and double click that or click the run button, voila, we have our first Objective C program up and running. So, new environments, slightly new syntax, some of which we're just going to close our eyes to for now. Let's go ahead and take a five minute break and we'll resume with more interesting Objective C apps. All right, we are back. Any questions on Hello World? Or anything we've discussed thus far? Yes. What is the NS Next step. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Any other review? Go ahead. All right. Yeah. For the at symbol, I know it was used to proceed the string to tell it that it's an NS,、mm -hmm. but it was also used like, on auto release tool. Does that just have like, a general tell compiler to do something or is it more different?、Parts? Good question.、Um, the at sign we've seen before strings now, and we've also seen it between, before auto, re,、uh, auto release pool. I believe it's been used by Apple to implement new functionality because it does not collide with any existing use of a symbol. So it means very different things in those contexts,、um, and those are the two primary ones we'll see it in. But it's not some special, it doesn't have some overarching meaning other than it was available. All right. So. 
in terms of bootstrapping yourself and learning this stuff and mastering this stuff ultimately, besides the books, realize there's, there's a huge amount of material online. And certainly buying a book is not prerequisite. The entry point to most of Apple's、uh, software development resources are all at that URL here. You can always just Google iOS SDK, and this will lead you to this particular website.、Um, realize a couple of things.、Um, it's fine to log in, and you can create an account using your existing Apple ID, which you use with your iPhone or iTunes or the like, or just sign up for one. For free, if you, if you want. Do not you do not have to pay the $99 or $199 to become a certified Apple developer. What that typically provides you with access to is Xcode and older versions of it, and Snow Leopard compatible versions of it, for instance. It also allows you to install software that you write onto your own phone. As I think I mentioned in the first lecture,、uh, Apple has this funny way of making you pay them to install software on the phone you already own、um, because you essentially need the right kind of encryption keys. And the like to do this. However, because we're a class, we do have an academic account so that so long as you guys provide us with your unique identifiers for your devices, and we'll get to this in a couple weeks with Project Two,、um, you can install software that you write on your phone for free. The one constraint is you can't then add that software to the App Store. So if you decide at the end of the semester or mid semester that you want to try selling or giving your app away for free on the App Store, that's totally fine. You own the software, not the course,、um, but at that point, you'll have to pay at least the $99 fee in order. To do so. So just realize that.、Um, in terms of finding stuff here, this is frankly where I think things get overwhelming. I never really learned this stuff well by navigating Apple's website. There is a lot of sample code, there's a lot of tutorials, but they're sort of, at least for my brain, all over the place. So to be honest, Google is your friend. So like if you look up NS string reference, Um, you will then dive deeply right into the documentation, which generally looks like this. So it's actually quite good. Once you get to what you're looking for, like something like this, it's actually modeled、um, similar in spirit to like php.net, whose documentation I think in general is great.、Um, similar in spirit to a man page, but a little、uh, certainly more web friendly. So what you'll see here in the NS string class, And we'll tease apart some of the syntax here soon. You see what its parent class, if any, is.、Uh, if you're coming from the world of Java from, a,、uh, from high school,、um, recall that there's the object superclass from which everything descends. So there's some hierarchy built in automatically to Objective C. Notice that there's these protocols here, conforms to these various things, but we'll talk briefly about those this week and next, and we'll see them more over time. And then there's just links to related resources. And then if we start scrolling down, the overview is generally helpful if you want to understand what the class. Is. Let me keep scrolling, 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 and here we go. For some reason, they call these things tasks, but they really are just methods, although you also see people refer to them as messages, which has a slightly different semantic meaning, but does,、uh, refers to the same kind of thing. And believe it or not, these are all of the various methods that are associated with the string class. So if you thought of our, all of our getters and setters were、uh, a lot earlier, Well, welcome to the NS string class.、Um, now, frankly, this is the sort of thing where odds are you won't need most of these, and you probably shouldn't care that most of these exist. But much like PHP, which tends to have the kitchen sink of methods and functions,、um, so does Objective C have a huge amount of functionality built in, for better or for worse. So, typically, Googling around, consulting Stack Overflow, consulting a book, or just reading through the documentation should often be your first approach to figuring out whether some function or method exists. So, as for These minus signs and plus signs, which we saw briefly up here, these actually have special meaning, which we'll get to in just a moment. All right, so data types. So Objective C supports C. It's a superset again, which means you get char and float and、uh, char and float and long and long, long and all of these, but you also get some additional data types. Among them, these bool in all caps, which unfortunately,、um, given the language's history,、um, the value of a bool is not true or false. It's not a one or zero. It's instead. Literally, yes or no,、um, in all caps in both cases. So, just one of those things you get used to.、Um, ID is actually similar in spirit to a void star pointer,、um, which we don't talk about in 50 really. You might have seen it in CS61. A void star pointer is just a pointer that can point to anything, an int, an object, or the like. It's a way of very weakly typing、uh, some variable in C and treating it however you see fit, or coming up with very generic data structures that store pointers to void objects, anything.、Um, ID Has a little more functionality built in, in that it's similar in spirit to a void star, that you can have an ID、uh, variable point to anything. 
but it will see that it has special meaning when it comes to something called nil and being、uh, passed messages. So, this is a useful object oriented thing. Nil is like null, but we'll see that whereas in C, dereferencing null. Calling a method on, or call,、uh, let's see, yeah, in C, dereferencing null generally was, did what? Segfault, very bad, right? So dereferencing null or garbage pointers is a very bad thing. Objective C is much more forgiving. If you accidentally or knowingly try to call a method、uh, on a null object, now called a nil object, nothing bad will happen. It will just silently ignore the method call on it. So this is a good thing. It can still mask errors if you didn't quite intend to do that, but it can also avoid a huge number of bugs and problems in your code. So we'll see that as a feature. And how do you leverage that? So, in terms of other data types that you don't get with Objective C per se, but you do get with the foundation library. And recall that this library is akin to standard lib.ih, standard io.h from C, but you just get more stuff in foundation.h and its various files. You get things like ns integer, ns point, ns rect, ns、uh, size, ns unsigned integer.、Um, the only point of confusion here is that even though these things are capitalized with ns, they are not in fact objects like ns string. String actually is, as we saw from its documentation. These are type defs, which, if you recall from C, allows you to make one word a synonym for another. And so we did this in like PSET 5 and CS50, where we had a byte. Well, we actually、uh, type def that to like an unsigned char, 8 bits. Same deal here. So an ns integer is essentially an int underneath the hood, and an nsu integer is an unsigned int. This is just Apple's way of providing an abstraction layer so that, in theory, they could change the underlying. Implementation of these data types, even though in practice they're not likely to change, but just realize they're not objects. They are primitives and it's just a syntactic、uh, potential for confusion. All right, here we go. Here comes the fun syntax. So in PHP, we don't have the notion of a header file, right? We pretty much just put everything in .php files. We can isolate classes to their own PHP files and methods and controllers and models to their own files, but there isn't this sort of dual existence of two types of files in PHP or most languages for that, or in many languages for that matter. But in C and in Objective C, we have it. So in Objective C, typically, if you want to declare some class, Like we did at the very start of today in PHP. If you want to declare a class in Objective C, you put that declaration of the class in a header file, in a .h file. And the syntax you use is this at interface, the name of the class you want to declare, in this case it's foo, colon, the name of the class that it descends from, if any. Because we're using Objective C, it will almost always descend from NS object or something else. Uh, so, that you at least get some base functionality from the, the entire framework. Open curly brace, close curly brace. And inside those curly braces, as the comment here suggests, that's where you put your、uh, instance variables, things like a student's name, things like a student's year, and any of that kind of data that you want to encapsulate inside of this object. So, points of confusion here this is a class, but it's at interface.、Um, PHP has interfaces, C or Java has interfaces,、um, Objective C has Interfaces, but they're really classes. Okay, so at interface is a class, it's just different jargon for the same idea. What Objective C calls protocols are equivalent to PHP and Java's interfaces. Okay. <laughs> Just Google it when, it when you're confused. All right, so now, and this is a bit of the syntactic messiness, when you actually want to declare the methods that are associated with this class, you actually put it outside of the curly braces, but before the symbol at end. So this is just one of the things that rubbed me the wrong way the first time. You get used to it and everything looks beautiful eventually, but for now, just realize there isn't quite the beauty of PHP or、uh, Java that encapsulate everything that's related with big curly braces. In this case, the method declarations will actually be outside. Of the、uh, curly braces, but before the at end symbol. So just realize you just kind of have to get used to it. All right, and now the .m file. In the .m file, it's actually a little more straightforward. At the top of the file or thereabouts, you would say at implementation, the name of the class that you're implementing. That's it. You don't have to mention the parent class with a colon or anything like that. Then, where the comment is, you put your definitions of methods, you implement them, and then at end at the very bottom. And in theory, you can put multiple classes in the same file, but generally we'll segregate things to separate files, as we've been doing for student classes and course objects and the like. All right, checkpoint. Any questions thus far? All right. So,、um, instance variable. So, what is an instance variable? Not necessarily in the context of Objective C, but in general. What's an instance variable? Yeah. A variable that will belong to a specific instance of a class. So, like, 
Perfect. Perfect. So it is a variable that belongs to a specific instance, aka object of some class. So we did this in PHP earlier. We had a student class, and inside of a student class are two instance variables, name and year. And they're instance variables in the sense that you can only set those once the class actually exists. This is in contrast to something called a class variable, which is shared by all members of that class. And just to put this into that same context, if more familiar, let me go ahead and just pull up a quick text editor. So earlier when I said class student, and then I had public, we'll go back to ver version one, public uh, year. If I now did, uh, let's say, static, actually, can I do this in PHP? Yes. Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> that, you were my Google. Um, if I say static foo, in PHP, the syntax for saying that you want a class variable is to say that it's static. So it's not public or private. It's actually public by default, but static, which means that all objects that are instantiated from this class will have that same value of foo. And in fact, you don't even need to instantiate an object of type student in order to access that foo variable. So it's kind of like a class constant, but it's not necessarily constant. It can be um, mutated or defined by you. A priori. So that's all we mean by that. So instance variables are essentially the types of variables we've been talking about all this time. Just as in PHP, you can specify things like private and public or protected, um, where they generally mean what's uh, familiar to you, and protected is essentially somewhere in between public and private. But we'll see these more over time. So class method. What is a class method? Well, just like a class variable is one that exists inside of a class, even if you've not instantiated any objects. And when you do, it's shared by all of those objects of that class. A class method is one that you can call on a class without having to instantiate an object in advance. You can just call it. So you can think of a constructor as effectively being a class um, method in the context of, say, uh, PHP. Um, or some other languages where you can call it explicitly before you alloc call a, uh, before you have an object of a class. So the plus is what makes a method a class method. You can call it before you've instantiated an object. So here's how we might use this. Um, here's a snippet of code, one line that specifies how I can declare a pointer to an object of type student. All of that should be familiar from the world of C on the left hand side. Pointer is called student, class is student, pointer is indicated by the star. On the equal sign, now we have some new Objective-C syntax. So in PHP, recall that you can call methods like s and then arrow foo, open paren, close paren, and that's how you invoke a method called foo on an object called s. Well, in Objective-C, the syntax essentially becomes this whereby you have open brace, close brace, s space foo on the inside. And the jargon to use here is that you're not really calling the method foo on the object s in Objective-C. You're passing the foo message to the object s. And it's sort of a subtle distinction. It's more important over time, especially in the context of nil. But these are effectively equivalent. So this is the first thing you sort of get used to. For those familiar with Lisp or Scheme, um, realize that these are our parentheses. Um, but that language is much worse with its syntax. All right, so passing a message. Now, instance methods. These are methods that, conversely, can only be called when an object of some class actually exists. So this is how I might declare some instance methods. And the very top, and you can do, you'll see things differently stylistically. Apple typically has the minus sign, a space, then in parentheses, the return value of the method, then no space, then the name of the method and then semicolon. Since we're just declaring the methods here, we're not actually implementing them. So on the top there, we have an example of effectively a getter. So instead of calling it get age, it's just called age in this case. And then we have a method called set age, and it takes an argument of type int, whose name is, the name of that argument is age. At the bottom, these aren't constructors per se. Um, in Objective-C, the notion of a constructor is effectively broken up into two pieces. The alloc method, which you can think of as similar in spirit to malloc from the world of C, and then an initialization method. And this is not a language requirement, but it's a human convention. Almost always, when you initialize an object in Objective-C, you will call some method whose name begins with the word init. And the whole method's name might just be init, or it might be init with name. And the idea of Objective-C methods is that they're actually a little verbose. 
um, in that they're, in theory, they're supposed to read almost as phrases or sentences. So the name of the method at the, the third thing here is just init. And it takes no arguments, so you don't have to specify a colon or a data type or a variable name. But this one's method is actually called init with name and age. So it's kind of a funky thing, and the word is broken up. The, the method's name is broken up into two places. But to be clear, the name of this fourth and final method here is init with name and age. And the fact that it says and age here is just an Objective-C convention. Some of you might think this is ridiculous. You frankly get kind of used to it, and it's kind of pretty when your method calls read like sentences. Um, but realize that this is very much a convention to construct things in this manner. Yeah. Uh, the before the name of the correct. That's the type of the variable, uh, the parameter age. So what about void? Uh, what about what? Void That's the return type. Okay. The return. So this is the output. This is the input. Okay. Output, or in this case, no output, hence void. And these are two inputs to this one. OK. All right, so that's what that's going to look like. And here's how we might call them. So now consider this a fragment from an actual program. If you want to call the age getter on a student object, you quote unquote pass the age message to the student object with syntax like this. This is, of course, useless because I'm getting the value and I'm throwing it away. I should probably have an assignment operator up there. But again, this is just to demonstrate syntax. This is a setter. So I'm passing the set age message with an argument of 20 to the student object. That doesn't necessarily need a return value, even though it might have one. Student in it, this is just initializing it. I don't know what that means. Maybe it initializes the student's name to John Harvard in some 1636 year by default or something like that. It's unclear, but it does some kind of initialization. And this is more explicit. And here, too, realize you will get compiler errors early on if you forget that quote unquote is different from at quote unquote. And almost always, certainly for now, we're going to be using ns strings, not char stars. So that'll be the common case. All right, so now selectors. Um, this is a word you'll hear, and you will even see a special keyword that is the at sign selector. Selector is essentially the name of a method for now. You can think of it as that. So if you see in documentation and textbooks or the like, the notion of a selector, we're generally referring to the name of a method, such as these here. All right, so let's actually start doing something here. Let me go back to Xcode. And we'll still keep ourselves in the context of a command line application for now, just so that we don't get things cluttered with um, various iOS specific things. So let me go ahead and open up command line tool. I'm going to go ahead and call this students1. I'm going to leave foundation selected, company identifier is the same, doesn't really matter what it is. And I'm going to use automatic reference counting. So let me go ahead and click next. Uh, sure, I'll leave a Git repo selected. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And now I have a set, the same exact template that I started with before. So what do we want to do here? So let's go into first files that we don't need. I'm going to delete the man page just so that we're not distracted by stuff we don't need to care about. I'm going to go into main.m. I'm going to close the right-hand side and recall that this is the boilerplate code the sample code that I'm given initially. So let's go ahead first, though, and define the notion of a student. I'm going to go up to the project. I'm going to say new file. And you can also get to this from the file menu, as in most IDEs. And notice that I have a few choices here. And in early on, almost all the code you write will be iOS. Almost all the code I'll write today is macOS only. So I'm going to jump down to macOS here, just to keep things simple. And I'm going to choose Objective-C class. And I'm going to click Next. I'm going to give the class a name of student. Notice it's asking me, what do you want it to be a subclass of? Fine, NS object. That's the most generic parent to have. Now it's just asking me where I want to save it. I want to save it inside of my student's, uh, my student's project. So let me go ahead and click OK. And all this did here for me is create these two files for me, student.h and student.m, just with some sample comments, really, and very little more. So let's go over to the header file, the .h file. And notice it did give me a little more than comments. It gave me an import, which is useful to have. It gave me the equivalent of a class declaration here. And so now I need to decide what do I want to associate with a student in terms of instance variables. Well, for now, I'm going to go ahead and say that everything should be public. Just we're going to do this sort of version 1 style and improve it thereafter. Um, then I'm going to give the student an age. I won't bother with year just yet. NS string. And notice, as with most IDEs, you get nice little autocomplete, which frankly can help, learn the, help you learn the language. And then 
name, star name. So this is now my class. I'm not going to bother having any methods just yet. So I'm going to go ahead and delete the white space. That's it. So this is pretty comparable to what we did at the very start of today with PHP, but we're using age now instead of year, just so we have a smaller number.、Um, and then this way you can play along at home with the sample code online. All right, well, let's go into now the M file. And the M file by default looks like this. Notice this line is important. Just like in C, if you have a header file you wrote, you'd better include or import it. And then as for the implementation, eh, we're going to keep it super simple, just like PHP initially, no methods. So that's it. Not a good implementation of a student, but at least it is a version one. So now let's go over to main.m and notice that I again get this kind of skeletal code here. The auto release pool、uh, symbol for now is important just to keep.、Um, we'll tease apart eventually what it's actually doing, but again, it has to do with memory management. So what do I want to do? Well, let's go ahead and create an object called Alice here. So student star Alice gets, how do I, without looking at the online code, How do, I declare, how do I instantiate an object of type student? Yeah, I'm back. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah. OK, good. Sorry, speak a little louder. Oh, so we want a student object, though. So, what's the class in question? So, as simple as student, yep. So, we want to allocate the student. So, we need alloc, right? So, recall that alloc is a class method, the plus sign, recall from the earlier slides, which just means you get this,、uh, you can call this before an object is instantiated. And that's perfect. Otherwise, we'd have a catch 22. You can't, inst- can't call a method on an object that's not being instantiated unless it's been instantiated already. So, here, We have alloc, which is a class method. So we can, this is how we effectively malloc a student object. Now, wait a minute. In my .m file, in my student.m file, I had no methods deliberately a few minutes ago. How is there this alloc method in, in the first place then? Yeah. Perfect. It came from NS object. So the value for us thus far of dis,、uh, inheriting from NS object is that we get a few things for free, among which is the alloc method. So we can at least minimally allocate objects of any type, in this case, student. So recall from PHP also, when you extend a class, as we did in PHP with the extends keyword or in Objective C with the colon symbol, you inherit all of the methods of the parent class,、uh, depending on visibility. So alloc is one of the class methods we then get access to. All right, so what's it yelling at me about? Well, I've already made a mistake, simple as this code is. It's not liking this S, it's not liking this A. So let's click on this symbol here. The red line then shows me the results of pre compiling this with this error message use of undeclared identifier Alice. So this is one of those things. This would, the same message would be pretty much the same in C. It's actually misleading. Surely the thing doesn't know what, who Alice is, but it's actually confused by what? What's the error? Yeah. That,、oh. oh, go ahead. I think that it's trying to say like, you don't have a variable that's Alice, but you're just instantiating the variable. So it's the first instance of Alice. OK, so it's true that this is the first instance of Alice, but the explanation is actually a little simpler. I think I heard it's student. So when in doubt, if it looks like A L I C E, that actually looks perfectly fine. It's a variable, it shouldn't have existed before then. Look to the left of it, and typically that's where your error is. And so, you know, what keyword might the compiler not yet know about student? Well, that's because I screwed up. I didn't do up here import quote unquote. Student.h. And recall from C, angle braces means default standard libraries that come with the system, quote unquote, are files that you yourself wrote. So let me go ahead now and save.、Uh, what's it? Oh, OK. So now it's yelling at me for a different reason. Whew, that's OK. Unused variable Alice. That's OK. I only wrote one line of code. But now the red error is gone. This is just a warning. All right, good. Now we're on our way. So, what do I want to do next? So, let me go ahead and just like in C, let me give Alice an age of, let's say, 20, which has got to be an int. Let me go ahead and give Alice a name of quote unquote Alice, but I already made a mistake. Go ahead, say it again. The at sign, right? So, recall that in student.h, I have a name property or name field called name, but it's of type NSString star, which means down here I'd better assign it 
at quote unquote. And sure enough, if I click on the little error message here, incompatible pointer types, assigning ns string from char six. So char sticks, it's, it's an array, char star effectively. So this is the compiler trying to explain as much to me too. So now I've put the at sign there and save. Sometimes Xcode's a little slow on the uptake, so just save it and maybe wait a second, and then hopefully the error message should disappear if indeed you've corrected it properly. All right, let's do Bob in the same way. So student Bob gets student alloc. This is going to give me another instance of a student object. Let's go ahead and set Bob's age to 21. Uh, Bob. Uh, name and notice it's trying to be super helpful as I type. Notice that there's some other stuff in there that comes from a parent class, so I can choose age, name, or this other thing. Let's just do name, and his name will be quote unquote Bob. I did it again, so let's change that to this. And then lastly, let's go ahead and greet each of these. So let's greet Alice, and then down here, let's go ahead and greet Bob, and let's go ahead and define greet as follows greets the student by a standard. Error. All right, so here we're going to go ahead and say avoid. Let's do greet student s. And then all this is going to do is a little debugging message ns log. And then notice that it's trying to be helpful as to what I want to type next. So hello, comma, percent, and it's not s. Take a guess as to what the placeholder is for an ns string object. Percent at. All right, so I see that you are percent %d years old, just to go back to our C roots here, comma, and then just as in C, name, s arrow, age, and that's it for the greet method. If I save, it's yelling at me here. What's it yelling at? Conflicting types for greet. Uh, oh, interesting. Oh, OK, and that's simply another sort of C style error. What do you need at the top of a file in C? The prototype. So we also need this here because we have to educate the compiler. Void greet student student star s semicolon save scroll down and hopefully yes it's happy again. All right, so let's try this. So now recall we created a class student.h and .m resulted from that. Super simple, everything's public. Uh, student.m had nothing in it, but we do need it because the class needs to be defined. In main.m, we're going to create Alice, give her an age and name, and greet her. Same deal with Bob, and hopefully greet will get called both of these times. So let me go up to the pretty little iTunes button, run. It's compiling, build succeeded, and sure enough, if I zoom in on the little de uh, debugger output, hello Alice, I see that you are 20 years old. Hello Bob, I see that you are 21 years old. Okay, so lots of room for improvement, right? What's one of the stupidest design decisions we made about a student? Right, it doesn't have anything in it, right? We're violating all of the fancy, nice little rules of thumb that we talked about earlier about encapsulation and data hiding and being able to validate data when you set it. So that was probably a cheat to just say everything is public and we're going to access it with the arrow notation only. So let's try now to improve upon this. But any questions on what we just did in this first example? Yeah. Oh, a prototype is just the return type, name, and arguments to a, method, uh, to a function that in C and Objective-C need to be stated at the very top of the file. So a C compiler, an Objective-C compiler is kind of stupid in that you have to tell it in advance what functions exist. Otherwise, when it encounters the names of those functions, it won't know what to do. So because greet was defined at the bottom of my file, but it's used higher up in my file in main, I need to inform the compiler of it even higher up. Or what's a possible workaround to needing the prototype at all? Just move the function to the top of the file, which is a solution. It's not always possible, especially if you have circular references. But also, it's just nice, typically, I think, stylistically, to have main be the first thing in the file. So it jumps right out at you. All right, so let's go ahead and improve upon this one. Let me go ahead and define another command line tool, students2. Let me go ahead and hit Enter, Enter, and we're back at the point where we have a very simple starting point. And in version 2, let's at least introduce the notion of some setters or getters. Um, let's go ahead, actually, and pretend that I just followed all those steps. Let me go into lecture 4, students 2, and voila. We've just done what I said we would do. 
So here we have it in student.h. So this is almost identical. Notice that I did do this in advance, but I still have main.m, student.h, and student.m, and all the other stuff, but I didn't touch any of the other stuff. We're only looking at three files at the moment. So in student.h, what's a little different? All right, so it looks like now I've done a few things that are different from before. One, Inside of my student interface declaration, I still specify name and age, but for some reason I've prefixed them with underscores. Why might that be, if you have a hunch? Yeah. Yeah, so this is just a convention. When you anticipate variables being private, typically a convention in Objective-C, in Java, in other languages is to prefix them not with two, but with one underscore, simply as a visual cue to you and any other developers working on the project that this is private. It's not something publicly accessible. It's just a useful trick. In the Windows world, you will very often use uh, standard letters. Like in the Windows world, you'll say P for a variable name, a P foo, to indicate that foo is a pointer, and Microsoft has other similar similar conventions. Underscore typically connotes the idea of private. All right, so this is a little different, age and name. Now what are these things called again, these four things collectively? Methods. So methods, and specifically, so instance methods. Instance methods meaning they can only be called once objects of type student exist, and the minus sign means exactly that. If they're instead class methods, it would be a plus. And if we actually looked at the code that someone wrote to implement an ns object in the .m and .h file for it, we would indeed see a plus for what method? Alloc. It's for, for the allocation method. All right, so these things we've seen before, albeit in the context of a slide, or we've seen things similar to this before. Age is the getter, um, set age is the setter. So whereas in the world of Java, it's common to say get foo and set foo. In the world of Objective-C, it's common to say foo and set foo. It's just a little cleaner, so you don't have to say the word get all over the place. So age is the getter, set age is the setter, and same deal here, name and set name. And notice that the data types are just different here for ns strings instead of ints, but realize they're returning pointers. So if you hated pointers in C, well, they are indeed back. This is not an abstraction we're going to be able to wave our hands at, um, as in Java. They're still there, but realize that um, it's, it will be slightly less easy to crash your code as a result. All right, so that's it. And the only interesting thing to note, curly braces end up here. All of this stuff appears raw in the file, but before the dot, the at end sign. All right, and here's the .m file. So now we have the same thing before, at implementation and the import up top. So that means here comes our implementation, all of my methods. So how do I implement these? Syntax is pretty much the same. Just like in C, you copy and paste your prototypes and then remove the semicolon and start using curly braces. Same deal here. So uh, minus int age is the getter. I'm just going to return underscore age. You don't need to, you shouldn't use this. Doesn't exist here. Um, you simply mention the name of the variable because when you're in the context of the uh, object, the student object in question, underscore age, refers to the instance variable. All right, same deal for name, return underscore name, and set age, we're going to do something very obvious. Underscore age gets age, and then down here um, we have name, underscore name gets name copy. That's actually kind of interesting. So we've not seen this yet. This is a message pass from a message called copy, the method being passed to the object called name. And I say object because it's an object of what type? It's an, NS object, it's an NS string. Why in this case do I want to copy the name and then store the result in underscore name as opposed to just do underscore name gets name like I did up here? Yeah? Is it because you're passing in like the address? So if like say later on somebody changed what's that address to some other string? Exactly. Exactly. So this is the, the danger in pointers and in C also is that if you're passing pointers around, if you just copy the pointer, you're literally copying the pointer to the same chunk of memory, which means if someone else in the program, some other method changes that person's name, you don't have the original name. You have now the resulting change, which maybe is what you want, but more likely if you've got an object called student, the whole idea of encapsulation is that you store your own state and it should be pretty independent of anyone else's uh, uh, functionality. So in this case, we indeed do want to copy the name string by passing it that method. And what it effectively does is returns a new pointer to the new chunk of memory that has identical copy of DAVID or whatever the student's name actually is. So that's the one distinction there. All right, any questions syntactically? 
All right, so now if we go back up to main.m, in this case, things don't change all that much in terms of allocation, but notice that the getter and setter are now being used. So rather than, rather, the, get, the setters are being used here. Rather than just use the arrow notation, which you'll generally not use in Objective C um, for reasons of um, encapsulation, now we're passing Alice the message set age colon 20 to set her age. The name is being passed as well there, and then we're greeting her. So we'll see how the greet method, uh, greet function has changed. Bob is the same deal. And then if we scroll down here, notice that it's almost the same code in the NS log statement, but now I just say s name and s age instead of actually um, using the arrow notation. So in short, even though the syntax is kind of different, like none of these ideas are yet new um, other than some of the jargon that we've been using versus PHP and even C. Any questions? All right, so let's start to clean this up. Um, one of the most powerful things about Objective C is that we can actually eliminate all of this stuff. Like this, we only have four. But recall the story that we started with. If you have all these getters and setters, suppose we do add email, suppose we do add dormitory and uh, phone number and the like. My god, we're going to have a dozen or more getters and setters in this file. And thankfully, and one thing Java does not have um, to the same extent but that Objective-C does, is you can automatically create all of these getters and setters for you, even in a more effective way than PHP's underscore underscore get and set. So let me go ahead and open up version 3 of this here. And in version 3, notice what I've done in my .h file. So has anything changed, little sanity check, has anything changed in my interface declaration for my instance variables versus the last example? Someone go on the record with a yes or no. OK, good. So nothing's changed. So that's exactly the same. So this stuff is also the same. This stuff now is new. So notice we have at property. So here in answer to Kevin's question about the at sign, again, it's being used here for a new piece of syntax, at property. We have some kind of comma separated list of things inside of parentheses. Then we have, OK, now it's familiar, int age and a string star name. So let's come back to what this means in just a moment. And let's look instead at the .m file. And what we have in the .m file is this. So same deal as before where I do have these getters or setters, but the advantage now is that we're one step closer to being able to do this automatically. So notice here we've done a few things. At property, int age, at property, and a string name. What this is going to allow us to do next is one, automatically create all of those getters and setters. We'll soon be able to delete all of those. And it will also let us invoke these things using a slightly more friendly dot notation. Um, so you might recall from Java and other languages, instead of using arrow notation all over the place, you can do something like s dot foo. And one of the things you get with Objective-C properties is that rather than have to say something annoying like this all over the place, open bracket s space foo, close brace, which recall we did in the greet method, right? Instead of saying something like this, uh, s arrow foo, we had to say open bracket s space foo. It just becomes a mess. It's really hard to read, certainly in longer chunks of code. Soon we can start saying s dot foo. So the mere fact that I've still implemented in this version 3 all of my getters and setters, but I've told the compiler to make me properties called age and name, what this is going to do for me is ensure that I can actually start using that dot notation already. So it's just syntactic sugar, but this tends to be a nice thing, especially when you start writing the same thing again and again. And we'll come back to this in just a moment. So that's going to allow me to use, in short, a little notation like this down here. Alice.age gets 20. Alice.name gets at quote unquote Alice. This is in contrast to what? A moment ago, these calls looked like what instead? This was Alice set age 20. And this other one was Alice set name colon at Alice. So what has the mere use of the at property keyword done for us? Well, one, it's literally let us rewrite these two lines as these two lines. And they're arguably cleaner, right? They do the same thing. How did it do that? Well, this is part mostly by way of convention. The reason that you should, even though you don't strictly have to, call your getters and setters um, foo and set foo 
with SET capital F as a convention is when you start using the app property keyword, Objective C, specifically the compiler, is going to assume that when you say Alice.age equals something, it's going to automatically call the setAge method on that object for you with the value that's on the right hand side. So it's just, again, syntactic sugar. It's doing the exact same thing we could have done five minutes ago, but frankly, it's getting a little more familiar, a little friendlier, and just more readable ultimately. And similarly, if we now look at the greet method down here, notice this too. This, come on, this is more readable than open bracket, s, space, and so forth. And that's what we've gotten now with properties. But we can take this one step further. If I now go ahead and open up version 4, and again, all these files are available online if you'd like to tinker at some point. Now let me go into student.h, which looks a little different here. Notice that I've gotten rid of a few things. This is version 4 now. What's disappeared from this file? It's definitely different now. All the getters and setters, the and setters have sort of mm, somehow disappeared, and all of the Instance variables have disappeared on me. So this does not seem good. This seems like a step backwards. But let me go to the M file. And oh my god, I can literally rip out all of the code I just wrote in Objective-C and simply say, synthesize me, a property called age, and back it with an instance variable called underscore age. I could call it anything I want. But this one liner here is saying, synthesize a property and make sure you use a variable called underscore age to store that property. The property is defined in the other file, declared in the other file, and we'll look at that again in just a second. But what this means more specifically is create automatically for me a getter and create for me automatically a setter without me writing a single line of code besides this one here. So this is a huge leap forward, frankly, because what we can also do now is also enforce a few constraints. So now we can tease apart this comma separated lists. So at property int age, at property ns string star name, did all that. But what about these getters and setters that are going to be synthesized, that is automatically written for me by the compiler? They can adhere to a few attributes. So this comma separated list, and it, the order doesn't matter. I tend to be anal and just alphabetize them. But assign means when you create the setter, go ahead and literally do underscore age equals age. So assign means literally implement my setter in a way that uses assignment, just like this. By contrast, and you can kind of guess now, when you say copy instead of assign, what kind of setter gets automatically created for you? Underscore name gets, yeah, so the name argument that was presumably passed in to the setter and then pass it the copy message. Where does the copy message or where does the copy method come from? Where was it defined? So in the NS string class, in the NS string class. It's an instance method that you get for free. So that's the distinction there. So assign, this is OK. I don't need to copy the age per se. Why? Right, so it's a primitive you don't need to worry about. And specifically, I am copying it. But when you copy a primitive, you're literally copying those 32 or those 64 bits from the right to the left. So you actually do have a true copy. The problem semantic, just uh, conceptually with a pointer is that if you literally copy the pointer 64 bits over from the right to the left, what are you getting a copy of? The address, which is not what we want, because the name might mutate outside of the object itself. So copy in the sort of human, what we mean sense, is to actually dereference the pointer, copy the chart characters there into a new memory buffer, and return the address of that new buffer. So it's copy in the sort of human sense, not in the super literal bitwise sense. All right, non-atomic, atomic. So if you've taken um, CS161 or certain other classes, um, and we talked about atomicity earlier in the semester in the context of database transactions. If something's atomic, it means it all happens together without interruption or not at all. Non-atomic means you have no such guarantee. Um, in this case here, and this, I am writing the simplest of stupidest programs called Hello World. Like I don't have multi -thread, multiple threads running. There's no GUI involved here. There, there's no worry uh, for, a, there's no need for atomic operations because indeed, if you do use atomic operations, I, let's pretend we have no idea how they're implemented. They've got to take some amount of effort, some number of CPU cycles. So why bother? If you're not in a multi-threaded environment, there's no threat of multiple threads interrupting each other. You don't need to spend those extra CPU cycles, however much they are. Uh, for more on this topic, Google the terms locks or semaphores or take CS161. All right. <laughs> Lastly here, this one's obvious. Um, Read-write means give me a getter or a setter 
An alternative to this keyword is read only, one word. And that just means give me a, a getter. Don't give me a setter, because I don't want the state to change. I can still initialize it with some other method, but I don't want to give it a setter property. So that's all those things mean there. So already, hopefully, Objective C is getting kind of compelling. Um, let's skim to. Um, Let's do one other thing here, real fast. So, if you do nonetheless want to override one of these automatically synthesized setters, realize that this is possible. Notice that in version 5 here, this is identical, so no change to my declaration of a student. But if I do want to override, and this is the most clever thing I could come up with in the middle of the night. Um, if I do want to override the setter that would otherwise get generated for me, but I still want the property, I still want my syntactic sugar and my dot notation and all of that, but I don't want the default behavior for a setter because I want to do some validation or I want to do something stupid like this, well, I can override what would have been automatically synthesized for me. And you can kind of see what this is, you can kind of infer pretty much what this thing is doing. There's some new syntax, so let's see you <laughs> emphasize the syntax and not the functionality. So if Name is equal to string. So already, if you didn't like my uh, PHP's long function names, get ready for Objective C's. Um, is is equal to string colon at David. So this is how you test two objects of type ns string for equality. Can't use equal equals because what would you be comparing otherwise? The pointers, and we learned in 50, that's very bad, right? So here's how you do it at a higher human level. All right, so if the name is equal to David, well, this appears to be changing my name to dummy. But more interesting is how is it doing that? So underscore name, which is the instance variable that I have told the compiler to make sure exists, even though I didn't declare it anymore in my header file. This is, notice now the nesting. This is an incredibly common paradigm. In Objective C, almost always when you allocate an object, you are going to call both alloc and a method that is called in it or whose name starts with the word in it. Now, this, of course, is in contrast to everything we've just done in examples one through four, but almost all, where we only used an alloc method thus far for Alice, but that's because I hadn't written any in it methods yet. So, ns string alloc gives me a new ns string, but I immediately am going to initialize it using a method called in it with string. And what string am I going to put inside of it? At quote unquote dummy. Where did this come from? Well, let's go back to that string reference. Um, in it with string. There it is. So let me click on the little hyperlink there. And you can see just sort of PHP net style what's actually inside of that. Returns an NS string object initialized by copying the characters from another given string based on that signature below. And dot, dot, dot. You can then follow along with sample code if you want. So that's just an example of referencing the documentation. So that's the only thing that's doing for us, it's allowing me to add some custom behavior. Otherwise, go ahead and actually copy it. But notice, I did still have to tell the world that, you know what? I am going to adhere to copy semantics, not assign. I'm using copy. Now, even though I'm overriding it with dummy, it's at least a unique copy of quote unquote dummy. So it's still adhering to the notion of a copy, something that's unique only to me. Well, we can take this one step further. Let me go into example six here. And in example six, we have now my own init method. So let's look at the header file here. Right, just as in PHP, we started cleaning things up. Rather than use arrow notation and the like, or setters explicitly, we kind of want the equivalent of a constructor. So again, in Objective-C, you don't really have constructors. You have a combination of alloc, which does memory allocation, and init, which does the initialization of that object. And this is why, again, they're almost always called together in one nested statement. So init with name. And age, we saw this syntax before. Here's how I declare in my h file. Notice I'm still declaring properties because I want that same dot notation ability. And now in my m file, what do I do down here? So one, I did give myself, even though I didn't declare it for some reason, an init method. So what name and age does apparently a student get if you just call alloc student init with no arguments? So apparently, John Harvard in 404, and I think I did the math correctly um, based on his actual age in Wikipedia. All right, so that was like five minutes of my life last night. All right, so <laughs> I procrastinate. So in it with name is a little more compelling in that now I can specify a more explicit name and age. So how do I do this? Well, let's tease apart what's going on here. So what do you think self is referring to? Or what's it equivalent to in PHP? This, right? So this uh, self is this, albeit with some syntactic differences. So if self equals super init. So the 
NS object class comes with its own init method. And this is my way of ensuring that at least this object has been initialized however Apple wants all NS objects to be initialized. And only if that returns a non nil pointer, that is, it all worked, nothing went wrong. Do I want to proceed to then、uh, edit the data inside of it? So, self.age, notice I'm using my own properties, which is convenient. Self.age gets age, self.name gets name. And again, the only reason I can use the dot notation is why? Because now synthesized isn't the key part, the, the use of at property. Synthesized just means I don't have to write any of the getters or setters. Property is what gives me the dot notation there. All right, so now I can return self. And similarly here, do I return self? After initializing it. Why did I not need to declare init inside of student.h? I could have, I just didn't need to. The answer lies somewhere in here. It's NS object, right? Init is the method that, like in Java, the object class, everything has something and everything does have this automatically,、uh, you already have this automatically, this init method. And what about ID? Why am I returning ID? What is ID? Sorry? Yeah, so it's essentially a void pointer with new fe other features that we'll see before long, but this is just one of these conventions. I could actually say, you know what, this is a student object. It's obviously going to return a student pointer, but it might actually return nil. In the event something goes wrong, and nil is not null. It's not the zero pointer. It's actually some special sentinel that comes with Objective C. So ID is going to allow me to sort of transcend C's very primitive handling of null pointers and now return nil potentially. So ID just means that I could return nil or a student star, or, you know, frankly, it just is easier to always say ID for all init methods because it sort of refers to whatever the object is in question. So it's part convention, but it's also part. Feature, but we'll see those features before long. So, just to tease as to where we're going to start going with this, thus far we've just kind of tinkered around with syntax and with、uh, basic OOP functionality of Objective C. We can start doing interesting things, and we'll start leveraging these things in the context of iOS programming quite soon. So, in this example here, this is version, what was it, 7. Notice what I'm doing here is now I'm really taking advantage of the foundation、uh, framework, which comes with a whole bunch of stuff for free. Remember, in C, you get so little for free. PHP, you get like everything、um, in the language itself. And C, you get the standard template library, which is huge, has lots of things like.、Um, Uh, linked lists and arrays and trees and all of these fancy data structures, not arrays, all the others. And here in the foundation framework, we have NS mutable array, where NS stands for. Next step.、Um, mutable just means that it's changeable, and array is an array in the normal sense. So in Objective C, there's actually two types of arrays there's an NS mutable array, and there's an NS immutable array, which is the opposite. It's an array, but it ca its contents can't change once you initialize it. Now, this seems a little weird that you the burden is now on you to decide do I want mutable or immutable? And again, immutable doesn't mean empty, it just means you have to decide in advance what you're going to put in it. Why this distinction, do you think? Why are there two types of arrays in Objective C or really in the iOS SDK or the macOS SDK here? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's performance, right? So the reason is that if you know in advance, this is just a hard coded list of things that I'm going to iterate over a lot. I don't need any sort of fancy adding or deletions. I don't need to do any memory management, therefore. And that means I can throw away a lot of potential cycles or even code. And so it's a performance detail. So if you know in advance that this array is not going to change, you might as well make it immutable. But in this case, I did decide on a mutable array. How do I allocate it? Well, again, this is the incredibly common paradigm. Even though, again, at the very start of today, we just called alloc. Almost always, you will call alloc followed by init or init with something, some method that starts with the name with. Notice what we can do now. The students is the variable and it's of type NS mutable array. I can call add object. How do I create an object? Well, I can allocate a student with a name of Alice and an age of 20. I can do the same thing for Bob. And then, just as in PHP and in some other languages, you have this notion of fast enumeration. You don't need to do a for loop with the i and the n and the plus plus and all that. You can just do for student s in students, greet each of those students iteratively, use our properties that we synthesized in the .m file. 
uh, for students, and voila, we now have sort of a function that's taking advantage not only of these OOP principles of encapsulation, also some of these objective C principles of like properties and the like, and we finally have the ability to express ourselves in a more interesting way than just allocating objects and greeting them. And that's where we'll pick up next Monday when we actually move all of this to the context of iPhones and iPads. See you then.